in defoliation. They're strictly in you for use in bowl opening, but in situations such as this, obviously we don't need any help. So a situation like this, you could go with materials that just strictly defoliate the cotton, take the leaves off materials such as Folex and uh, AIM, DROP, materials such as that and DEF, which do a good job of removing material, the leaf material from the plant, but do not have the job of opening the bowls. To find out more information on the materials that can be used for cotton and defoliation, their strengths and weaknesses, and the particular things that can be used on and the rates in which they can be used, you can go on lsuagcenter.com on the cotton webpage and find the cotton defoliation guide for more specifics on the individual materials. The rice stink bug life cycle begins when the adults move into the fields, typically around that heading stage of growth when they're going to be most attracted to the rice when it starts to flower. What they'll do is they'll, they'll start feeding on those grains, the adults will mate, and then the females will lay eggs on the leaf blade of the plant. They lay their eggs in two rows of little barrel shaped eggs, and depending on the maturation of the egg and the development stage of the, of the uh, nymph inside of the egg, they're going to vary in color from green at the more immature stage up to red when they'll start taking on the color of the actual nymph that's going to emerge from that egg. Uh, note that if you do find egg masses that are black in color, they're probably parasitized by a parasitoid wasp, which is going to target the stink bugs in the field for control. And what, they'll, what they will do is they'll actually develop inside of that egg, uh, feeding on that nymph as it's maturing, and then the wasp will emerge. So that's a nice biological control mechanism that we have that occurs occasionally in rice stink bugs. Unfortunately, it typically is not enough control to actually suppress the populations and so we don't have to put out insecticide treatment. Nymphs are going to emerge from the egg as the first instar. They pop out of the little egg capsule and then they'll actually start moving around on the plant and from the first instar stage all the way through to the adult stage they will actually have the ability to damage the crop by feeding on those developing grains. So they'll feed on the panicle as the grains are maturing as uh, we discussed from flowering all the way through hard dough they can cause injury to the crop. There are five different instars of development and the length that that whole life cycle takes varies depending on the temperature. It's typically going to be about 30 to 35 days for insects of this type. And the type of metamorphosis is referred to as incomplete metamorphosis or hemimetabolous development. What this means is that the nymphal stages gradually get larger, they shed a skin and then they mature to the next uh, larger stage and so you'll see that the morphology or the way that the insect appears is actually going to vary depending on the instar of growth. It's important to note this because if you have a field that you're scouting for and you have a, maybe a few adults out there but you have an abundance of immatures, you can, imagine, you can predict that you're going to have an ongoing problem with that stink bug population because you have many insects that are going to be maturing and have more of an ability to injure the crop. We recommend that you begin scouting for stink bugs when the rice field as a whole is at 50% heading. Uh, what we mean by that is when you have 50% of the heads uh, of the panicles that are emerging from the boot. When you're scouting for rice stink bugs, it's important to note the stage of growth of the rice crop. And so it's, this is what we would refer to as split boot. The panicle is just starting to be emerging out of the boot as it splits open to allow that panicle to, to emerge. This plant by comparison is you can see it's a little farther along and would be considered at the heading stage of growth. If you want to see here you can see that in general we would assess this portion of the field as being approximately 50 percent heading which is the time at which we would recommend you begin scouting for rice stink bugs on a regular basis so that you could start looking at the population and putting out a treatment to avoid injury. This rice here is at the flowering stage of growth this is going to occur soon after heading which is when the rice moves out of the boot and the panicle is everted um, outside of the boot area there. So you can see that rice is a self-pollinated crop and the, the pollen grains are exposed here for the fertilization process to occur. If the rice stink bugs move into the crop at this stage of growth and start feeding on these, these individual flowers, they can actually cause abortion of some of these flowers so that fertilization won't occur and you'll actually have blanking in the panicles.
So that's pretty direct injury they can cause to the crop and cause a yield reduction. It's important also to remember to monitor the weed species um, of grasses that you might find associated with your rice field and to try to manage those weeds so that you don't have high populations in the field because they compete directly with the crop but they can also serve as a good resource for the rice stink bugs. As the crop is maturing they can be attracted into the field and they can reproduce and feed on the heads of different weeds such as this barnyard grass here which is a ideal host of the rice stink bug and they're very attracted to this plant. It's also important to manage the grassy weeds on the edges of your field to try to keep the populations down. Hi, my name is Natalie Hummel. I'm the rice extension entomologist from LSU Ag Center. And what we're going to talk about in this video is why different stages of rice are more or less susceptible to stink bug injury. This field that we're standing in right now is a field that varies in maturity from milk to soft dough stage of development. This rice crop is at the milk stage of development of maturation of the crop. The panicle matures from the tip towards the, the stem of the plant. So keep that in mind when you're trying to assess the straight stage of growth that you're going to see more mature grains towards the tip than you will at the base. At the soft dough stage, this is when the grain would be susceptible to peck injury from this point on and also possibly some partial injury to the grain, although most likely you would, you would see peck, which is caused by a fungus that's going to be inserted into that grain when the rice stink bug feeds on it. And this will cause a black or brown mark on the grain and can re reduce the quality of the grain. So that's important to keep in mind when you're assessing the stage of growth. But what you can do to see what it is is just squeeze the grain. This is actually at more of a uh, soft dough stage of development. I, I was now able to puncture it or to squeeze it and get it to produce milk. So you can see what it looks like at the soft dough stage of development. It's just kind of a softer grain as opposed to at the milk stage, which you can see if you, if you go further back down, you pierce it and this is what comes out of it is a milky consistency. If a rice stink bug comes into a field at this stage of growth and pierces that grain with its mouth part, which is called a proboscis, it's kind of a needle type structure that they'll use to extract some of that milk out of that developing grain. And this can cause partially filled grains to develop, which can re result in some reductions at the mill and a reduction in the amount of head rice. Hi, my name is Natalie Hummel. I'm an extension entomologist and associate professor at the LSU Ag Center in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. My primary responsibility is to work with the rice crop to develop integrated pest management recommendations. And today, our discussion is going to focus on rice stink bug scouting and management and why you should be concerned about this when you're producing a rice crop. The rice stink bugs move into the field at heading and they're most attracted to the crop at the flowering stage when they will move in and they can actually start to cause injury in the crop at that stage. What we're going to do in this portion of the video is demonstrate how to appropriately scout the field. We do recommend taking 10 consecutive sweeps with 180 degree on the angle as demonstrated um, here. We're going to demonstrate this in the field in just a second here. Take 10 sweeps in 10 different locations in the field, making sure that you sample both the outside and the inside of the field because there are times when you might have a population that's congregated more on the edge of the field and not so significant in the inside. So we do encourage you to move into the field and, and take some actual samples and then put out treatments only when they exceed the published thresholds. We're not going to talk about the thresholds so much today because they do change with time based on research results and also the variety and the yield potential of your crop. So contact your local extension service for those guidelines on thresholds for treatment. What we're going to do now is one of my graduate students, Bryce Blackman, is going to demonstrate how to properly take some sweep samples in the field. You can see that it's a bit of a laborious process uh, walking through a flooded field taking these samples so we do realize it's a challenging thing to do. But it's important that you do take the sweeps in the appropriate manner. Uh, when you're done taking sweeps you would then look inside of your net and count the number of rice stink bugs. After you take the sweep you would quickly open it up and count the number of rice stink bug adults and immatures that you find within the net. 
Current LSU Ag Center recommendations focus on counting the number of adults, but nymphs can also cause injury. Those are the immature stage of the stink bug. So you can see here that we have Some of them got away. We had approximately 15 stink bugs in this sweep, and so you would take that into account, reference whatever the current thresholds are, and then make a decision about whether or not you should put out an insecticide treatment. I'm going to spend just a moment here talking about managing alligator weed in the fall. Alligator weed is most commonly a problem in rice, um, but it's also a problem in ponds, and it's also a problem, occasional problem in, in sweet potatoes. And now when we think about ponds and we think about sweet potatoes, especially in sweet potatoes, there's only one way to control it. There are no herbicides that we can apply in sweet potatoes in crop that will selectively control alligator weed. Now while we have herbicides in rice that will selectively control it, it takes multiple applications in crop. Same thing in ponds. We can manage it in the spring with selective herbicides in ponds, but it takes multiple applications. Now what's nice about it, or what's neat about alligator weed, is that it's very, very sensitive to a quart or to a pound of glyphosate in the fall. Um, we can apply, you know, sometime between mid-September to the mid-October, we can make one application and get 80, 90 percent control for out as much as out as a year to two years, depending on on the conditions, but um, that's the best time to manage it. The easiest time to manage it is in the fall. One other issue I'd like to take the opportunity to talk about right now would be how to manage some of the broadleaf weeds. The most common practice is to spray glyphosate on these fields to try to clean up the grasses. But what we're going to end up doing is creating a glyphosate resistant weed. Now this, act this actually is spiny amaranth, which is a very close cousin to palmer amaranth and water hemp that you've heard a lot about uh, with glyphosate resistance. So this is an excellent way to select for it. So when we've got broadleaf weeds, things like spiny amaranth or palmer amaranth or vine or teaweed, which would be the biggest problem that we have in soybeans right now, we're going to have to add something to the glyphosate. To date, the best thing has been lay-by pro to control teaweed. Now, for the pigweeds, I don't know, we may have to do something a little more strong, you know, even consider a dicamba or a 2,4-D type application. We'll have to watch and make sure we're within the uh, rules for making aerial applications of that. So. Good afternoon, my name is Bill Williams. I'm the uh, Extension Weed Specialist with the LSU Ag Center. Work out of the Scott Research and Extension Center in Winsboro, Louisiana. Um, I'm here today to talk about fall weed management. And the reason we want to talk about fall weed management because it is the primary reason that we're seeing an increase in problems in managing annual grasses such as what we see here in this cornfield, uh, teaweed. It's also going to be a major player with glyphosate resistant weeds. It just you know, after we harvest corn and after we harvest soybeans, we've got to start cleaning up these fields. And that's really what we want to talk about. Uh, if you look at this field, it's been sprayed with glyphosate. You can already see, we've already set seed on the, uh, this is broadleaf signal grass, a major weed and pearl irrigated corn. Yeah. And the only way we're actually going to be able to clean these fields up is as soon as, as soon as possible after harvest, these fields need to be mowed so you can re reduce the vegetation, spread it out so the weeds aren't covered up, so that when we make these glyphosate applications, we're going to actually accomplish something. One other issue on that while we're talking about it is that glyphosate is generally the herbicide of choice for, for trying to clean up a field. 
It's not going to do a very good job on large weeds, large tea weed, large pig weed, such as the pig weed behind us. Um, we're going to need something more along the lines of laid by pro. And really and truly, that's, that's basically what has been our most successful program is glyphosate plus laid by pro in corn. Now, when we talk about fall weed management, there's really three areas in fall weed control that we have an opportunity to work in. And the first one we've already talked a little bit about is the summer annuals, the things that we have coming up after harvest in corn and soybeans. The other would be the perennial weeds, things like Johnson grass, uh, alligator weed.